I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua. Today I had a question and we did a short on it, but I need to go into more details about what you can do and what are the risks of having a home that you're not living in full time if you're here in Nicaragua. What can happen if you're not around the house to watch over it and what can you do to keep it safe and secure? So we're going to get to all to that on today's, wow, we're going to get to all of that on today's show. It is a bright and sunny and windy day, so I apologize for the sound of the wind. It's a, I, I've been trying to record all day and I can't avoid it, but it is 36 degrees, which puts it in the high 90s in Fahrenheit, uh, and it's very bright and sunny. So it is a warm one. I'm actually recording this just hours before the Super Bowl. As soon as this one's recorded, I'm plugging in the camera, getting it uploaded, and I'm heading to the beach to hang out with a whole bunch of you ready to party on the beach. It's draft beers and brisket out at Desperado. So that is my day, that's what's going on. But I had this question and this is a good one and people need to understand it a bit. So if you're an expat, this could apply to non-expats, but the majority of my channel are expats or people who are looking at becoming expats. You will be expats in the scenario that you're worried about. And it is really common with expats for reasonably obvious reasons that you may have a house here, uh, either an apartment that you're renting or a house that you're renting or a house that you buy, property that you buy, but you may not be here year round. Maybe you're out traveling part of the year. Maybe you only are snowbirding here. Maybe you just live here part time and, and you you know stay with family. So you just come in for special time periods, whatever. But it is it ends up being common uh, for expats who have homes here to not have them be occupied all of the time. And this for obvious reasons, creates potential risks. So let's talk about what those risks are, just so we know what we're, what we're dealing with. The two main risks, one is squatters. If you have a house that is clearly empty for a long period of time, you could end up with someone living in it. Now, squatting in Nicaragua is much harder than squatting in like the US or UK, where there's laws that tend to favor the squatters pretty heavily. Here in Nicaragua, the laws are not so strongly in favor of squatters. The number of years that you would have to stay in a property is extremely long, and you have to improve that property. You have to put effort into it, which means investing in something you could lose if you're not there long enough or can't prove that you've been there long enough. So it can get pretty complicated. So you don't have the squatter problem like you imagine in European countries. Places like the UK favor squatters heavily to the point where someone breaking into your house one day could probably not actually that cause of pro that kind of problem, but it, you really do worry about squatters in a way that you don't other places. Sure, you could have someone living in your house, but as soon as you show up with the police, they're gonna be like, sorry, we're out of here. Um, that's what's gonna happen most of the time. The idea that someone's going to get possession of your house through squatting generally means you have abandoned the property for a seriously long period of time. So not something that actually comes up for normal people. But it's worth noting that, you know, people living in your property, even if they're going to vacate as soon as you return, isn't great. So just something to be aware of. The really big problem is people sneaking in and stealing your stuff because presumably if you're gonna be keeping a place, you're gonna be keeping it stocked with furniture and televisions and you know kitchen appliances and all that kind of stuff, things worth money. So the real problem with being robbed is that if your house is just empty, people will eventually notice that there's nothing going on and they'll take the time to figure out how to get over your wall, get through your gate or whatever, eventually get into the house, probably not do serious damage, but they'll work their way of getting your stuff out of there. It's worth a lot of money potentially, and if no one's using it and it could really feed their family, it's not surprising that crimes of opportunity are going to take precedence. So it is something to be worried about. It's true, violent crime is very low in Nicaragua, but crimes of opportunity are relatively high. It would be uh, extremely high compared to some places like the US where people tend to be very afraid of breaking into a house uh, and stealing items, even if they're not armed or anything, that can be really scary. Houses are booby trapped. There is a lot of electronic surveillance. There's just a lot of reasons uh, that it could be very scary. And the chances that you get killed during a home invasion, especially if it's a uh, unarmed one, like uh, I should say, especially if it's armed, it's super dangerous. But unlike here, where an unarmed entrance of a home would generally uh, have basically no risk of extreme life-threatening situation. In the United States, even casually knocking on the wrong door can be life-threatening. And so that makes uh, simply stealing from someone's home in the United States much less likely unless you're coming fully armed and prepared to invade violently. 
uh, you have to protect yourself and everything. Like, it's a completely different scenario. So here, what you end up with is simply a crime where people are pretty sure a place is empty. They quietly sneak in and look around and take what they can grab. It, it's way more common, um, but it's also not very scary. And it discourages armed home invasion because there's no need for that because you're not protecting yourself against armed protection in the house. It's a completely different scenario. Uh, now, not that it never happens, but it's it's definitely rare. Uh, so you can do a number of things to protect your house. Of course, you can do things like you would in the United States. You can put in cameras. You can have an alarm system. You can have automated, automatic lights, automated light systems, all kinds of things. Like automatic is when you have sensor. Automated is when they're turning on and off on their own to pretend like someone is home. Uh, you could have dogs, but of course, someone would have to feed them and stuff. Uh, there's a lot of things that will make it much less likely for someone to want to break in. Uh, what People do here, routinely, when you're looking for a serious amount of home protection, we have two basic things that almost everyone does, at least everyone who's taking it seriously, right? Some people just, ah, it's just a house, I lock it up, whatever, right? But a lot of us have colonial houses. I do not now, but I did in the past, where the roof is open. And that means if no one's home and people know no one's home, they can take a lot of time to quietly get up to your roof, they sneak a ladder in, they whatever, they come in from a neighbor's house, they get on your roof, then they lower themselves down into your house, and they're able to enter without having to break down the front door or whatever. There's a lot of open courtyards in Nicaragua, so that poses a type of risk. If you have a house that isn't like that, that you're able to lock up the entire thing and it's completely enclosed, that takes your risk way down, but it also makes it harder to cool and isn't as stylistically Nicaraguan. And ones with co open courtyards generally have very secure interior doors that treat the atrium like a open to the world outdoor area, which it is. Uh, so they do address it, but someone in your courtyard can much more covertly spend time breaking down a lock or, you know, using a welding torch to try to get in something to, of that nature because they're, they're not visible from the street. Uh, so, so there, there are risks that come with that if you have a place that's empty over time. What everyone does here is just completely standard, is either moving into a gated community, such as where I'm standing now. Here we have 24 seven security. There's, and I mean, literally the guard can hear me talking right now, stands right there. They know when we come and go, they know exactly what should be going on in the house. They communicate with us whether we're here or when we're away. Um, and so it really makes it that uh, there's, there's really essentially no way to reasonably break in here. First of all, it's double gated. We have our own gates uh, around our own house. That's unnecessary. We do it because we're keeping dogs in and we want to keep them safe. Uh, but then there's the main gate for the community. And we have neighbors who are very aware of our comings and goings and they know us decently well. And they would notice if something was awry here as well. They can certainly see us and we can see them. It'd be very hard for someone to break in to my neighbor who's right here because I would notice someone in their yard. I would notice someone on the roof. I would notice the sound of a lock being broken. And I certainly would notice someone taking something away and trying to get over the walls, our neighbors would notice someone scaling the walls. So there's a lot of just the community protects you in a gated community like this, where there's a lot of visibility and, and active guards. So it is very popular for expats at all price points, right? You could be very fancy or very affordable to be in a gated community. For some of my episodes you've seen, I have shown Ciudad Sandino and I show a gated community there. That community is for a, a relatively decent sized home, something that an expat on a little bit of a budget or just wanting to be frugal could consider and could be very comfortable and attractive and a nice friendly community that's really nice to, to just hang out in when you know have community barbecues and have a beers with the neighbors, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's a gated community. It's about $250 a month. So that's affordable for most expats to have that security. That includes the cost of the HOA or however you want to think of it. So that pays for your guards. Um, that That's really important. And so it can be very affordable to have a home that someone's watching over all the time. If you're in a community like this, it's a little bit different, but we, we pay a bit more. Um, but you, you get really extreme, um, you know, in, in those, those like Ciudad Santino, the example that you go watch my episodes, uh, they have like a guard for a large area. So, um, you know, there's a little bit more risk that someone could get in, but your neighbors are paying attention. People are really close to each other. Guards do patrol. It would be very difficult, but it wouldn't be impossible. I've never heard of someone breaking into a place like that. Here, it would border on impossible because we have guards that are literally right in front of the house. Um, if you were in the house and anything happened, you'd be trapped inside the house with armed guards uh, who could get to you very quickly and contain you until the police arrived. You'd be trapped inside the compound, inside another compound, right? It would be 
unbelievably dangerous and difficult to get into a place like this. So depending on your needs or just depending on what you want or depending on the kind of place you end up in, you may have a lot of security from that. So that's one system that works and is very popular, especially with people who want a little bit more of a hands-off or a little bit more of a Western approach. Having one of those gated communities, it kind of feels more like you're in the North, uh, meaning like the United States or Canada, where you don't have to worry about anything. And we have friends who live here in a very well-guarded uh, gated community in Colonia, uh, Colonia Universidad uh, and others in uh, San Augustine. Um, and they have a really tight kind of in between. So they don't have like private guards just for their places, but their guards patrol constantly. They know everything that's going on. Fatima is a residency of the Fatima is similar. They have people on bicycles or whatever, just cycling around all the time and really good visibility from every side of the houses. So it, it could be extraordinarily difficult for someone to get in and rob those. So you don't have to spend fortune and you can still have a lot of peace of mind that uh, and then you can like go out you can like leave things in your car outside leave your car outside you don't have to worry about anything if you live in the city you're very unlikely to want to leave your car in the street during the day sure but at night people put them into garages put them in their living rooms that's a common thing and lock them up so their cars cannot be broken into uh in the dark because there's no one patrolling the streets looking for for cars they're not gonna mug you on the streets very likely but if your car is there to be broken into and there's something in it well that's uh you know Violent crime is unlikely, but crimes of, of opportunity are, are relatively likely. Uh, so that, that really does solve the problem for, I would say, the majority of people. And if you're in one of the enclave communities, like you get in the San Juan del Sur area, often it's going to follow that model. So that's how a lot of people there handle it. Now, if you get to like the beaches out here where there aren't gated communities or any place where you want to have your own house with your completely own thing, you don't want to be a part of a gated community, you don't want to be part of an HOA. Um, and there are communities that are in between where they're not gated, but they do have a lot of neighbors. It, it, it's definitely not as secure as when you have security. Uh, for example, Casa Leon here in, in uh, Leon is, gives the feeling of a gated community like the one in Ciudad Sandino, but it doesn't actually have gates, but it has a long entrance that makes it very visible for someone to come and go. Uh, your neighbors have a lot of visibility. There is security in the community, just kind of wandering around, keeping an eye on things. So it's definitely not the same as a gated community, but... It's so safe that you may be comfortable leaving your house, especially if you combine it with cameras and stuff. You could text the security people and be like, hey, I can see something's going on in my house. No one's supposed to be there. They could be there in 30 seconds, right? That's probably not true, but under five minutes, uh, fast enough to cause real problems and be able to restrain someone until the police arrive. So, uh, so there's options at all price points and those you can get into under $150 instead of $250. So if you're worried about your budget, that those options still exist as well. Uh, now, like I was saying, if you want a completely flexible situation where you have just any house, maybe a, a farmhouse in the country or a beach house where you've got your own lot and everything's custom, then you don't have those shared security options. Realistically, of course, you could hire an armed guard service and use that, but that would be extreme, right? But totally an option. But what people do realistically is they have what's called a cuidador, and that is just a caretaker, right? And what often happens is you can just hire someone to come and watch over your place. I do have a bit of land that that, uh, we need to have a cuidador on and we just hire one of the neighbors to spend time there. So they, they hang out, they take some magazines, they take their phone and they just sit on the property for eight hours a day or 12 hours a day, whatever it is, I don't know. And uh, they keep an eye on it to make sure nothing's going on. And they live nearby and are always keeping an eye on it. They're not, we're not, we don't have anything to steal. So we're not worried about someone sneaking in, grabbing something and running. We're worried about squatters. We're worried about much more long-term things, people going in and trying to erect a structure, trying to take down a structure, something like that. So it, you know, only watching every so many hours is absolutely adequate. That, that kind of stuff can work. And a lot of people do that with their houses. Well, there's a guy who can watch over it. He works during the day, but he lives across the street. So I have him stop in every day and keep an eye on things, or maybe in the morning and in the evening, something like that. You could do that very cheaply, but it doesn't give you a lot of security, but it gives you the peace of mind that no one has, you know, broken in. There's nothing ongoing. People aren't just taking trucks up to your door, driving away with stuff. But what most people do is they either find uh, a family or an individual who's actually going to live on property. And it's one of the reasons why nearly any house of any size here has uh, quarters for someone to be living there along with uh, the owners. This is absolutely common. It is common in the middle of the city uh, where you can't have uh, an HOA. You know, you have like we had a house in La Barrio. There was space there intended for staff to live in the house and watch over it when you're not there. Um, or if you're like out in the beach, we see this all the time. The beach houses are normally built with a main house and then inside the courtyard or inside the, the, the walled area of the property is another smaller house, uh, which is meant for the cuidador to live there. And it could like 
Many times it's one person, but it's also common to have a family. And if it's a family, often you'll have um, the one of the, the parents will go off and have a second job. So they'll be away most of the time. The other one will live there, cook, watch the kids. And so there's always someone at the house, but there's also an additional income coming in from the person who's going to work. So it's a two income situation, but it gives them free housing. The assumption is that you will give the housing for free. Uh, there's probably a food allowance. So what does live in security often cost? Now this is gonna vary a lot by exactly what you do, but generally you're providing housing. Often you're providing some amount of board, such as food. Maybe they're cooking in your kitchen. Maybe they're sharing food with you. It depends on a lot of things. Do they stay there when you stay there? That that's the norm. They live there all the time. You come and go. It's really a problem if you kick them out when you're there and then you expect them to be there when you're not. Not that that's not available. It just adds a lot of complication because obviously they have to have a home kind of at will. They have to move all their stuff in and out or whatever they're going to use. So if you have friends or just a one-time thing where I'm going to be gone for three months, can you find a house sitter? Yeah, for sure. Maybe you can find someone who's currently living with their parents and this could be someone in their 30s or 40s who's living with their parents and would be like, oh, three months living in someone else's house. House, that'd be a nice break and they're willing to do it for some extra money of course those are those options exist but you're not going to find people who do it full-time professionally doing things like that so the standard the expected if you're going to do this you're going to provide a permanent home for the people who are doing that for you and so they just become and so these people you really have to trust you have to like having them there they become part of your ecosystem and it is not uncommon to hire people to do that and have the the husband be the security and maintenance and maybe the wife ends up being the cook for the house, maybe part-time and watching her own kids and stuff as well. There's lots of flexibility in this system. Typically you end up paying them, but it's not super expensive because you're providing housing and you generally give access to the house. So it's really common. For example, if you were to use the facilities here, we have a spot for that when we're not here that the cuidador would come in and use the big TV in the living room, listen to the big stereo, you know, use the kitchen for stuff. They have the yard to run around in. They can hang out with the dogs. They have outdoor furniture. They're going to get to live here and enjoy the place to themselves some of the time, in theory, if you're not going to be living there. So they, they get benefits from it uh, in addition to just having a place to live. Uh, so generally, the income is pretty close to minimum wage, depending on a number of factors. Do you expect them to do other things? Are they just there? They can't leave, but all they have to do is hang out and watch things. Then it's generally really cheap, maybe $200 a month. Do you expect them to be a skilled maintenance person who's going to do a lot of things? They're going to pay bills. They're going to fix things around the house. They may run to the hardware store, get stuff for you, take care of things and, and that kind of thing. Are they going to be doing construction and actually doing, you know, ongoing work? There's a lot of things that may make it more expensive, more busy or cheaper because they're just purely security. For a lot of people, it's, it's finding someone who can also do maintenance is a really big deal. And for a lot of people, getting someone who comes with a family and they also do cooking and stuff uh, can be very significant as well. So that can play into uh, your decisions around overall uh, help around the house uh, in, a, in a bigger discussion of how many staff, what kind of features do you want to have uh, when you're living here and how you want that to work. But from purely a security perspective, uh, finding someone who's going to stay all the time um, can be very wow. significant and very helpful. And there's my guard dog because someone just walked up on the other side of the gate uh, and uh, she's definitely letting us know that someone's there. So having dogs also a big thing because it's hard to sneak up. Uh, so that's kind of how that works. And of course you can end up paying four or $500 a month, depending on what requirements you have and what you want them to do. Uh, but it's generally not a super expensive thing because houses here are designed, uh, to have this extra space It's very, very common. It is expected. It is a huge career. It is a very important employment modality for the people here in Nicaragua. Uh, and so it can be a great service, right? This is one of those examples where by you living here and just by you living here, you could create an income for an entire family. Uh, and of course, if that person is going to be there full time, you pay a little bit more. If they're able to leave during the day and go work another job, maybe part time or full time, maybe they just take odd jobs away from the house. Um, that may that will make it less expensive. If they can't do those things, it's got to be more expensive because all of their bills have to be paid out of whatever you're paying them. Uh, so all those things are factors, uh, but it gives you an idea of what the range is. And uh, and it's it's very common. Um, so no one will be surprised that you want to do that. Um, and and that gives you the flexibility to have a home anywhere uh, and, and do just about anything. But as people mentioned, you do have to trust those people a lot. They have access to your home. Um, they become basically a part of your family. Uh, so they're very important uh, that you get along well with them and that they really do what you need and that 
you trust them around all of your stuff. Of course, you can combine things, right? You can have a Cuidador in a gated community where you have outside security and they can coordinate and talk to each other. You can have, like we do, a major domo who oversees the house and communicates with all the different people who work in the house and kind of acts like security, even though it's not an official role. You can have uh, friends who just stay in your house and handle things that way. Be like, ah, you know what? You get to stay for free or super cheap, but I'm gonna be gone for a little while. I need you to stay and be like, pay attention to the house or whatever. For us, if we were to be away ever, uh, which we are sometimes for like a weekend or something, we always have someone stay with our dogs in addition to security who watches over the dogs and make sure they don't escape. So there's always multiple people dealing with things in multiple ways. So we have an incredible amount of oversight for us all the time, partially because we have very nervous dogs who will try to escape or will hurt themselves and do need humans here all the time. They're a little bit pampered, but we did rescue our big one because she had severe uh, emotional issues and we knew that we would always have to have someone watching her as just part of our journey having dogs. That's a little bit different than normal people, but that kind of stuff can happen and you can deal with that here pretty flexibly. Hope that answers your questions and gives you a good idea of what the security concerns are, what the options are. And while we were doing this, someone did ask New World Money, asked me some things about how do you look at the statistics about violent crime and that stuff. And it is kind of tricky because there's so many places that want to promote things that are more opinion than statistics. Uh, and so most of the time, if you're looking for violent crime, you'll get things that are based on the Global Peace Index, which is not violent crime crime. They'll just put violent crime or put crime statistics or safety into the title. And then they'll say, well, based on the, the peace index, which is peace, it's a different thing. And peace is subjective, uh, very subjective. Um, and so some places that you would consider very peaceful end up ranked very poor, like it's all over the place and it's purely opinion. Whereas violent crime stats are not very opinionated. Everything is a little bit, um, they tend not to be. So I, I was showing a little bit about those. While doing that, the non-violent uh, robbery statistics uh, came up and it does show Nicaragua is very bad for robberies, but very good for violent crime. And so that's something you just have to be aware of. It's a trade-off um, and so it just played into this discussion that those are the things we're protecting against. You're really not worried about violent crime. You are actually worried about someone just being like, they're not home, I bet their TV could disappear, right? That's, that's the reality. So thanks for joining me. If you'd like to support the work we're doing here, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, watch an extra episode. Tell your friends about the show. Link to the show on social media. Let people find it and get into the discussion. Um, as always, get down there in the comments and let me know what you're interested in or ask questions about this or leave your stories of what you've done or what you've considered doing here. And uh, I will see all of you tomorrow.